So, um, who am I? Let's start there. So, I've been around in industry working as a technologist at a number of different companies on you know, networking, on, on operating systems, multi-threading, containers, early, in the early days of containers, right? Also been involved in the Internet Engineering Task Force, sort of when we drove IPv6 standardization, whatever it was, 20 years ago. Yeah. And, and, you know, standardize, implement, etc. And currently, I'm, for the purposes of this, I'm active in one of the projects in LFEDGE and on the LFEDGE Technical Advisory Committee as well. Um, so sort of part of the journey that's relevant to sort of setting this stuff up is uh, working with others, I've learned that security is hard. And it's sort of like you leave it up to the experts, right? Um, and then sort of like, okay, but how can we make security easy to use? So, oh, that's even harder. It's actually some of the things we've done, not worrying about the pieces, but how you make the system, right? But that's sort of like quite tricky to make it easy to use so that you don't have to jump through 12 hoops to set up security. Um, but networking is easy, right? Uh, but then, then as we started working in this more sort of industrial space and what does it mean to deploy things far out at the edge, realized that, well, it's actually not that easy. Um, so it depends what problem you're trying to solve. It's not networking on your server or your laptop anymore. So, um, so, so people that have been active in LFEDGE probably have seen this stuff, um, but it's actually useful to share with others that aren't familiar with the edge. It is a white paper that LFEDGE uh, has put together that talks about different parts of the edge and the different properties, right? Just to make sure that what we're talking about here is what I like to call the distributed edge. It's, you know, things that are sort of flexible enough that you can deploy different software on them, right? Um, there's enough headroom. They, they can run different functions that are not predetermined at manufacturing time. There's other things that are further out. The sort of typical constrained device edge is a PLC or something, that, you know, thermostat, right? Something that's built to have one, one function. There isn't room to run anything else necessarily. And, and some of it leads to, okay, how, how, how capable of this is this? Is this, is this a rack in the back of the store type thing uh, or a quarter of a rack? So that's the area that we're talking about. Uh, the sort of hardware, right? Uh, you know, think about small things like a Raspberry Pi compute module to sort of large, ruggedized, typically servers with multiple TPUs. Um, so what are the properties of this distributed edge? Well, the, the sort of difficult part is when there's no IT staff at all, right, on site. There might not be any staff at, at all. There might be like a couple of hours drive for, to find a human being, right, in some cases. Um, wind farms, solar farms are examples of this. Uh, but you still want to be able to patch, update software, recover from bugs or sort of software outages, right, without having to send somebody out with a truck. Um, the other thing that's quite common is that there's no or very limited physical security. Or even if there is, the, the meaning of physical security on, on, a, on a solar farm, it's like, sure, you have a fence and locks and a camera. If someone breaks in, the police can take two hours to get there because it's in the middle of nowhere, right? There's no city around anywhere. Um, so, so you, know, you still have to be prepared that things are going to be stolen, etc. You need to have strong integrity protection for the assets, that the data, whatever that you care about, right? Um, you might not have the traditional network security. When people deploy things in the cloud, Azure, AWS, Google, whatever, they provide tons of things you don't see, including, you know, prote to protecting themselves and their infrastructure, but also that helps for you, right, as the person deploying apps, um, um, which is, you know, firewalls, intrusion detection, prevention systems, etc. cetera. Right? Um, so, so you need something more there. Uh, in the industrial domain, it's still quite common that people want things to be predictable. They typically often run with static IP addresses. Right? The, you know, people might key these things in one way or another when you install something. The technicians that install things know what an IPv4 address is. I don't think they've tried IPv6 yet, but that's an aside. Uh, but but you, you sort of key this thing in when you, when you bring in some equipment. Uh, and then, you know, there, there are these security architectures or models like ISA 95 that talks about how you can connect control systems in a factory type setting or plant to the enterprise system. And they typically imply that there are multiple sort of application level proxies or whatever to make sure that nothing can come in and, and affect the, the control loop. 
So this stuff needs to be configured. So this is some of the sort of properties in general, right? Um, um, there's another angle of this, which I won't go into detail here, but, but there's application in a, um, implications of this, that your applications need to be able to handle intermittent connectivity. Um, things that have built, assuming that they can always reach this database service or whatever, might not work that well if the, the network actually goes out. Um, if you have large deployments, the sort of model that you go and, and reach out to applications to, to change their configuration might not actually work that well because how do you know whether the change took effect or not if the network went out in the middle of doing that? Um, so having sort of declarative configuration across the board, but in the context of applications, being able to have declarative application configuration as well so that, that you don't have to worry about, you, is this running version one or two or three of the configuration, right? Not, did this operation I did yesterday actually take effect because the network went out? Uh, there's questions around observability. Uh, it's, you know, have to be careful so that your metrics and logs don't consume all of the network out of the site. Yeah, that, that, that's not what you want, right? But you still need to know what's going on. So, so there's, there's, a, so there's a group of edge architects that have gotten together sort of independent of LF Edge, but they're actually starting to produce blogs out there that talk about some of this stuff from what, what have they seen. These are architects that have deployed this stuff in sort of retail and other locations for five years or so, right? So they have experience. Um, so that's sort of the application side of things. Um, but on the infrastructure side, and the, the reason we started this was that we realized that the infrastructure needs some new approach here as well, not what we have done with servers, laptops, smartphones. Um, so that's why we did EVOS uh, and made that part of LF Hatch. So it's an immutable OS, right? Some of this stuff comes from the networking needs. Some of it comes from security. I've talked about security before, so I'm not going to talk about that other than what's on this slide. But, but the key thing is that it's for scale, etc. it's built using an API. So you have a bunch of things deployed out at the edge, thousands of these things, right? You have some controller. In this case, it's referring to the either the LF Edge sandbox, um, which I'll touch upon, or there's an open, completely open source um, controller called Atom here as well, that we use for testing, among other things. Um, and the key thing in this, sort of from the infrastructure perspective and dealing with these issues, is this API that's over there, right? Because it's the thing that ensures that the infrastructure, just like the applications, operate with a declarative API with, with eventual consistency, et cetera, and other properties that, that make it actually work well in this, this flaky network environment, um, in addition to security and other things. And this is actually deployed at large scale, tens of thousands of locations um, uh, running today. So it's actually, it's actually real. Um, and now let's dive into networking. Um, so, the premise of this is that you know we want to be able to operate this at scale, meaning that uh, orchestrate, deploy, update applications, patch them, deploy new applications, um, change the configuration by using this controller. Right? But that means that these devices need to be always able to reach, always quote unquote, be able to reach the controller. Um, and, and that always in quotes is because, well, it's fine if they're disconnected for a while, right? be it minutes, be it days, right? With this eventual consistency approach, you can actually, when they get connected, they can do things, but they need to be able to connect at some point in time. So, so what is the network environment out here? Well, unlike the typical laptop, right? Or, or server, you know, they have multiple physical ports. Could be because you wanna have physical separation between the sort of shop floor network in a, in a factory and the sort of things that are facing out towards the enterprise network in the factory with these multiple layers of proxies, right? Uh, it could be because you have, you have, in some cases, different radio networks, different network technologies as well at play right, in these environments. Uh, so that's one thing that's, that's different. And the other thing, as I mentioned, static IP addresses and HTTPS proxies. Some of these proxies, uh, are there for security reasons, but they do things that 
that like content inspection, right? Uh, and that means that in some cases they do this transparently, meaning that they are what viewed as TLS man in the middle, that they make up uh, X509 certificates on the fly. This is all with the good intent of making security better, right? But, but they're actually breaking end-to-end -end security, end-to-end -end TLS in the process. But um, the, in other cases, you actually configure these things. So, so this is one of the companies I've worked at. You know, when you, you, when you bring your, your own device, you have to add this thing to the keychain as part of joining that network. Well, that is actually the certificate for that proxy slash firewall. So now I can actually do content inspection. Um, and that needs to be configured, right, if you have that. In some cases, if you have Wi-Fi or um, you need credentials, typically people don't use Wi-Fi to reach towards the internet, right? But, but, but in some cases you have LTE, private LTE or 5G, where you actually feed in credentials into that, well, you need to configure those, right? Um, and the last but not least, in some of these environments, particularly if things are moving around, you might have fallbacks um, that, that, you know, you have, have LTE or cellular or satellite fallback, but you don't want to use that unless the, the sort of cheaper alternatives are working. Uh, four out of these five you can do on your laptop or on your server, right? You just, in the simplest form, you just sit in front of the keyboard and you tap away and you configure these things. The last one isn't sort of, that requires a bit more tinkering, and particularly in Linux, but to sort of set things up that way. Uh, but the problem here is that there's no one there. There is no human being, right? So, so, so the, the, what people want to do in this domain in general is that they manufacture devices, they pre-install some software. Um, and the way we do this with, with eWorks is that you have some sort of factory, whatever, right? Could be the hardware manufacturer, it could be someone else downstream that, that pre-installs the OS, um, might do some sort of security inspection, etc., and then drop ships that to where it's going to be installed. An installer comes, um, screws that into a DIN rail or whatever, connects the Ethernet and the power, and then it powers on. And the default thing that, that, that we do, which is pretty common, is that um, you try DHCP on all of the interfaces. And you, if you get an address, you try to connect back to the controller. And now if you, you manage to connect back to the controller on one of them, now this device can be remotely managed. Right Now you can go from there. Now you can specify that, oh, by the way, I want to also use the Wi-Fi or LTE, right? But you actually got off the ground um, to do that. So that's actually the, the easy part, right? Um, the, the more difficult one is when you need something to deal with all of those other details just to get connected to the controller the first time. So we first started with a hand-edited JSON file that you can put on a USB stick to plug in. This is a bit error-prone, right? Um, so, um, so then we said, okay, let's do something slightly better. And, and the philosophy between this is the, the source of truth for this configuration comes from the controller. So you would actually specify it in the controller through the API or whatever. It would then you, that ask it to spit out a signed protobuf file so you don't hand editing things anymore. And it's actually signed so the device can verify the signature. Um, and then you can actually feed that to the device either through a, uh, as part of a unique installer image or as a separate sort of USB stick. Uh, so that's sort of like, here's one way that, that works as long as you, you have your device sitting over here, you have your laptop over here, it has you know, LTE connectivity or satellite so you can get to the internet, download this file, put it on a USB stick, plug it in, right? There's cases but when you don't have that because there is no LTE coverage, right? Yeah. So, so the, there's something that we currently are exploring, which is, okay, if I have a keyboard and a screen, can I actually plug that in and at least get some bootstrap thing in there? It's a bit like hand keying in the IP address type thing, right? Um, but the controller still remains the source of truth that the purpose of that is just to do the initial connection to get somewhere and then, then become remotely manageable. Um, but this is part of the bigger picture if uh, sort of like, yeah, you're going to have changes as well. So someone decides to change the proxy configuration for this network or, or something else, right? The DHCP server, the DNS server. Um, the model still is that, that, and this is not what people are used to with you sort of standalone devices. This is all about treating this as cattle, right? Um, they're, they're all configured centrally. 
but you update the configuration in the controller. The device picks that up over TLS, whatever. The device tries it, and if it works, it then switches to using it. If it doesn't, it's kept around as here's the sort of highest priority configuration, but since it's not working, I'm going to use the previous one that worked. Um, and this new one will actually be retried when the, when the one that it's using is failing or sort of periodically check, hey, did this thing actually uh, start working now? So this is basically providing this A, B, um, and, and there can be more than two as well. Similar to, to the way people typically do and we do with booting, that you have two partitions. You, if you boot one partition, if it doesn't work, you boot the other one. So you can actually do upgrades, changes, and have fallbacks. This is the same thing, but for the network configuration in particular. Um, because, as I said, the, this thing to be useful needs to be remotely manageable. Um, if we already lost the connectivity, what do we do then? We have cut off the branch we're sitting on. That guy up there. Uh, well, it's similar, but it's just that now you can't transport this configuration to the device over over TCP IP, right? You cannot connect to the controller. But you can, you, can, you can have some means of actually downloading this stuff, putting it, for instance, on a USB stick, right? And, um, and insert that in the device. There's some details about, well, do you really want to enable anybody that can walk up to this device to plug in a USB stick and it will mount it? Are there sort of kernel bugs that you, people can use to attack this thing? So there are some security policy questions in here. Um, which, which we're still sort of trying to figure out all of the details in the different cases. But, but the device basically can now pick the stuff up and, and try that configuration. So you have a way of rec recovering. Um, but the other thing in the same vein as, as the co initial configuration, having some local repair CLI in the case that you do not have any network con con connectivity at that site whatsoever, right? That you can actually use with a laptop or, or a phone or something. That, have a, a repair CLI, the keyboard mouse, uh, keyboard screen, whatever, you can go in and, and put in something that isn't necessarily trusted, but can be used to connect to the controller so you can then get the signed configuration from the controller, which is presumably the same, right? Um, so that's sort of the, the one of the challenges, just getting things configured and keeping them configured and connected. Um, okay. But people might have want to be able to do things while they're disconnected. So some of those use cases that that we're running is effectively planned. This could be mobile, right? Shows up in oil and gas. You, of course, the applications, the devices, they need to keep on running even if the internet is down. It's a given, right? Um, but but there might be cases when, in, in addition, you have some operator there that could see that hey, this thing is not working and. Just like what happens with software in general, computers in general, what do you do when it doesn't work? Well, you restart it, right, and see if it works, right? Um, so they need to be able to do that locally, but how could they do that given that this, this device and these applications are tethered to something remotely that you can't talk to, right? Well, the observation we made was you are not changing the stated configuration when you restart it. You're doing an operation, it's not a configuration change. So you can actually at some level have your cake and eat it, saying we have declarative configuration, we have a set of local operations that doesn't actually change anything from a configuration perspective. So restart and sort of reverting to a previous snapshot, sure, you will have to you know, resolve that later, but it, it's at least sane. The standard way this has been done in industry is people have started with local configuration. Take a server, take a Cisco CLI, whatever, right? And then they build some remote management system. And then they have, for re good reasons, someone needs to go in and fix one router or server. And it's like, OK, what's the source of truth? How, how long am I going to keep that local thing? Right? When I'm gonna, who's going to reconcile that thing with the central provisioning system? Uh, that's hard. right? So we actually, because we started at the other end, we said, OK, we can think about this to figure out what operations do you need to do, and how are those operations different from configuration. Um, so that's sort of, now we're getting in, into the more confusing part. So people talk about air gap networks. And, and this is sort of something that people are, in, in some domains, people are used to, you know, not connecting to the cloud, not using the cloud at all, because 
they might be regulation that says they can't do that. Uh, but, 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 but the vast majority of places, well, I think all places and somehow is actually using stuff that comes from the outside. But, but when you talk about this, you have to realize that there's different domains that think about air gap differently. The industrial form is we have a set of control loops that is affecting the, the pumps and valves and turning things on and off. No one should be able to reach in to, to affect those things, right? Meaning that no one can get in. Uh, the more IT form is we have a bunch of secrets, uh, credit cards, personal information, intellectual property, that should not be able to leak, right, uh, out. Uh, and, and when you talk about air gap, you need to figure out, well, what information flow is actually allowed? That, that's actually a key thing in this picture. In, the, in, the, in, the, in this picture. Um, but, um, oh, I, a typo. Uh, should say accept, but, um, but, but in both cases, people don't write their software from scratch, right? They import things. They run Linux, Windows, whatever, right? And they have a way of picking up a new version of that software, but they do that by auditing things. So if they're gonna run some software that comes from the outside, um, they, they, they know how to do that. Um, so, so we sort of started with saying, okay, if you have this environment and you still wanna have global policy saying, I, as a supplier of software, have tested these applications, these versions, uh, these are the ones that are approved for deploying in my enterprise, even if some of those parts are actually effectively air-gapped from that, that controller, you can still carry in those policies if you have a way of importing some signed configuration that can be audited, etc. just like you can import the next version of Ubuntu, right? Um, and sure, that might take a week, right? This is all about eventually getting the new versions out there. So you can actually do that, run a local server inside the plant, and what's key in this model is that the trust still remains with the actual controller. So this is just a, a different way, a non-TCP IP way of getting, getting the configuration in there. So that's, that's one of the other sort of challenges with networks here that they might not be there for you um, in different ways. So that's sort of like mostly about configuration and connectivity. But what about debugging things? And these networks are flaky. You could, have, you could have failures that happen sometimes on some devices because you have thousands of locations. You could have brownouts where things are slow timing out, right? How do you do this stuff? How do you catch these things when they happen? Well, you can't. And the cloud approach is, is, is quite effective and quite simple is that you just have lots of logs and metrics that you collect from your, from your servers, your VMs, your applications, your network switches, and now you can just go analyze that stuff. Um, but at the edge, you want to make sure that you're not spending all of your bandwidth shipping around the, this information just in case something goes wrong. So what we actually ended up building in EVAS for the network debugging is um, basically doing local tracing and having that be automated so that it, it, when it tries to reach out and, and, and connect to the controller, it will actually save some of the good traces keep them around for a while, but it will save more of the bad traces. And now you, there's a mechanism to sort of reach in when it actually manages to connect, assuming it does that sooner or later, and this is a temporary thing, you can actually go and collect that information. Um, so you can actually now offline analyze this stuff. But this is stuff that, this is just getting, you know, sort of the basic, we have an OS that runs application that's connected to the network to work, right? It's, it's not that, that easy. So I actually have a, let me see. I still have a minute or so, uh, but you can come and join us, right? The, the other thing I was going to mention briefly is, the, is that there is an LFH sandbox that you might have seen before. And where did I put that? That oh, I can actually try this even. Just this. Oh no. So you can actually go and and uh, sign up here. Um, why does it not give me the sign up page? Because I already did this yesterday. Huh. Was there a different URL? Hmm. Maybe I, I didn't check this. Is there a sign up one? Okay. Well, 
there, there, there's another page that points to this stuff, but you can basically get in and and you can now with just an email address or an LF. I think you need an, um, a Linux Foundation ID, right? You can actually sign up. You get your own sort of enterprise. You can now try things out. You can try out various combinations of Linux Foundation projects, right? Um, you can run just run, um, you know spin up an Ubuntu VM or whatever on, on Eve, or you can take some of the other projects like Fledge, uh, Adjax Foundry, etc. Right? So there's a, a um, not going to do a live demo here. I think I had it set up somewhere, but, but any questions? Yep. Are there any uh, projects afoot within LFH or elsewhere that you know of seeking to establish a, a more unified edge-based trust model like PKI, TLS, and Internet? where you have uh, a standard by which OEMs and device makers can embed keys that are within a broader trust model so that the provisioning issues and complexities that you were talking about can be mitigated. So um, an, an interoperable standard, a bit like Signal 7 for telecoms across energy, for example, um, so that there is less of a need for take notwithstanding all the things talk about intermittent networks and yeah. all those sorts of things. There's something which is, I mean, at the moment, often manufacturers will embed keys. The public I should have given this to you. So I'm, asking, recording. I'm asking if there are any projects afoot or um, standards in development of which you're aware that um, are building a universal trust model for devices deployed at the edge. The idea is to minimize truck rolls and and uh, having people going out on site or, or whatever, um, where the hardware root of trust is anchored in a broad trust model all devices subscribe to when they're installed. So rather yeah. than individual manufacturers, a universal trust model. So, so there is something called FIDO device onboarding, right? And there is actually a, which is a standard from the FIDO Alliance, and there is one of the projects in LFH is FDO. So this actually originally contributed by, by Intel, but it is based on that. And so the, it's a set of tools, right? So the idea is that the hardware manufacturer provisions some keys into the TPM and it produces, the manufacturer produces a signed voucher. And, and the idea is that you can now actually, they basically end up signing it. If I'm selling it to you, I ask you for your certificate. I will sign it so that you can actually verify that the stuff came from me, right? It's basically signed for you. And if you resell it, right, because you're a distributor or whatever, right? So that's the model. And then the device now can actually come up and connect to some service um, that can be determined based on the main name of where it's running, so it lo looks for a local server or whatever. And now it can actually connect that and sort of chain securely saying, okay, this device is telling me to go to talk to this configuration server. I know I can trust it because I can actually validate this signed voucher that passed through the supply chain together with the hardware or sort of in parallel with the hardware and actually check that, okay, I know that this, they sold it to the guy who owns the certificate. So I can actually trust the certificate to get me whatever configuration I need. So in general, you can use this to install packages, right? You can, you can get credentials loaded because you know you can actually trust that one because it was sold that way. Uh, and the challenge with this, this has been around for at least five years as, as a technology is, okay, chicken and egg, who starts doing this stuff, right? Which hardware manufacturer will do this? Uh, uh, so, so, you know, even, even Intel has a hard time forcing things to happen, right? So, uh, but I think that, that we actually did a demo of this stuff in, in May at the One Summit in, in, in San Jose, where it was us, it was Eve that was doing this, um, the FTO project, Intel, Advantec was providing the hardware uh, and, and the Open Horizon project in LF Edge that was running the actual server that you connected to. Basically showing that this stuff is actually possible to do, but still need to get some hardware manufacturers that see that, okay, they need to do this, this provisioning in their factory. And is that within the context of a PKI that they establish for the certificates or they leverage the existing I mean, research or it, it, it is X509 certificates, but it's, it's, it's not necessarily, it doesn't mean that you have to go buy certificates from some CA and pay for them, right? It is, it is you could do this stuff entirely with self-signed things, as far as I know, right? 
So that, that's up to you as a manufacturer whether, whether you, you know, yes, if I'm selling it to you and you're you know, a company, well, you presumably have a certificate that is provided by some known CA, right? But I don't think it's required. I think you can sort of, when I go and order things, it's hand waving because no one has done this, right? On the order form, I basically say, here, copy and paste in an X509 certificate, right? Uh, that, that will work as far as I know, right? Yeah, I, I guess when the ecosystem gets large enough and you don't really know whether you can trust those vendors or, or whatever, yeah, yeah. you look at something that happened recently in uh, uh, Lebanon and you get an idea of uh, what might, might be the case, for example, a supply chain attack. Um, unless you have an attestable trust model around the outside of that, uh, you might not necessarily be able to trust the... Oh, yeah. And, the, 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 and that's the other part that the people are working on and sort of how do you integrate various forms of attestation into the system, right? So what we do today is fairly simple in, the, in terms of, yes, we can actually measure, use the TPM measured boot to at least measure all of the firmware and the boot chain, right? And if people do that in the, in the manufacturing line, right, and get those first measurements, now, you, at least from that firmware software perspective, you could save that saying, okay, did that change? When it shows up and it's installed, is it actually the same? Because otherwise, something's, something's happened, right? And but still allow for, yeah, they will send out a technician to update the BIOS, right? Whatever. Okay, you need to know that you did that so you can say, okay, I'm going to accept this new, new BIOS, right? But, but the sort of deeper attestation, that's the, still, I think, work in progress with leveraging you know, the, the, these technology pieces here with SDX, et cetera, right? The, this, you know, trust zones on ARM. It's more about putting together a system that actually works where this is easy. Right, right. It's, I guess my question comes down to that broader trust model across the whole ecosystem yeah. where the FIDO or others are working on it. Yeah, I think there's attestation stuff in FIDO, right? There's various attestation things going on in the IETF as well with the remote attestation working group as well. So, it's, okay. But it's sort of like, Again, it's specifying the, the components, right? The protocols you will use, et cetera, right? The architecture, okay, where's the solution, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. Okay. Anyway. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh. It's mic coming. I think it was on already, so. It was on? No. Oh, it was not? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, my question is about uh, networking. If there is a, a concept um, in this scheme that uh, regards overlay networks, for example, you mentioned ruggedized servers with GPUs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're currently working on ruggedized DPU. Uh, uh, devices, I mean, from uh, network devices from NVIDIA, similar to GPUs, and uh, there is an embedded uh, OBS layer, uh, open V switch with VX LANs, so you can have a vast network of interconnected uh, devices all over the place by using, for example, v VX LANs or something like uh, WireGuard. Is, is there some um, idea of uh, in, in your project of connecting at least the controllers in a, in a single LAN? So, so, I mean, we've sort of been on a journey with this. When we started this about six years ago, we said, um, well, it's clear that people will need to do some east-west communication and this is hard because of intermediate you know firewalls and nat boxes and other things so from day one we actually worked on a on a protocol that is actually less known called uh, the locator identifier separation protocol lisp um, and that was actually integrated in e because we said okay people are going to need this stuff right it turned out that no one was actually using it instead what people would do is in, in the sort of commercial side of things, they would use some SD-WAN solution. They would have a vendor that their IT department is running in their data centers, and they said, okay, how do we bring this stuff out at the edge? And the answer is easy. Uh, you just deploy a, a VNF that implements that stuff, right? 
So that's actually what, what people are doing, whether those VNFs are coming from SD-WAN vendors, firewall vendors, right? And they configure those things. So, so it means that the, the base substrate for bringing things up does not actually use this, but the actual application traffic will not actually run on top of this. So from an application perspective, you're in complete control in terms of def defining your overlay topology, et cetera. Right? So, um, and that seems to be the way the, the industry is moving. We're still sort of trying to figure out, does it make sense to have something that's more closely integrated, right? Some open source components, but but it's uh, but it still sort of seems to be that well, people want to connect it not only between the different edges, but also towards you know the, the data center and the cloud. So.